name is Tim Risto. I've got a company called Superfine Amp Works. I do a lot of work on vintage amps, repairs, restorations, mods, that sort of thing. Also been a longtime employee of car amplifiers. I've uh, been their head tech for many years, although I'm sort of just on a part-time basis with car now since I've had my own shop for the last seven years or so. But uh, I guess the main thing we're going to talk about here is the Marshall, uh, the Cheap Trick Marshall, the Rick Nielsen Marshall. And I was uh, particularly tickled to get to work on it because I listened to the Budokan record five million times when I was in whatever it would have been, sixth grade or something like that. And so that was pretty cool. Um, and it was a bit of a trick to work on because I don't know if he's if Richard or if uh, Luke has ever seen the amp in person or ever looked inside of it, but it was a mess. <laughs> so I had a lot of work to do, uh, but went through and uh, got it all running uh, and working. I had to do a lot of reverse engineering of the sort of circuit that was in there because it was pretty heavily modified for stage use and for various you know applications that Rick Nielsen would have had with it. Uh, interconnections on the back that were disconnected that would have been used in a buffer splitter box so that all his amps could be combined that sort of thing and uh, anyway uh, went through kind of drew it all out figured out what was what took it all apart and cleaned up a bunch of broken solder joints and broken components etc on the printed circuit board this is a 1974 um, Super Lead 100, actually a transitional Super Lead 100. We'll give you a little history here because it's got the larger, sort of medium sized Marshall logo and the cabinet that you would have seen more on the Rocker Switch era JM piece, which started probably later in 74, 75. Uh, Greg Germino will probably call me out on that <laughs> one, but somewhere in that era, this one has characteristics of both models. And it has the printed circuit board versus the turret board that the 72, 73 era Marshalls would have had. Makes it a little tougher to work on, uh, especially when there's been mods done because I had to lift a lot of components out to get the board flipped over to work on it. And it was uh, just covered in dirt and scum and various things that accumulate from years on the road and years in storage. But anyway, uh, I was able to not only reverse engineer all that stuff, but get it running, get it sounding good, and then do a few minor tweaks of my own to do some things like get the sweet spot in the master volume a little more usable uh, and, and kind of be able to dial it in a little easier. But other than a few very minor tweaks, I was able to reuse virtually all the wires, all the components, all the capacitors, everything that were in there. It would have been easier to change all those components or take it back to a stock configuration, but I understand that's not what we're after here. We like the cheap trick amp. So having said all that, I'm gonna just give you a little tour through the controls. Uh, there are some unconventional controls uh, due to the mods, and also uh, there are no labels left on anything from years on the road. So it'll be handy for you, I imagine, to know what these things do. So let's give it a little bit of a shot. Here. As you can see by the tape label there, that is the master volume. That is the only thing that you can actually read on the whole amplifier. Um, the normal thing that would have been in this spot would have been an input jack. This is a four input Marshall, a non-master volume Marshall originally. Um, but they modified it and normally you'd had two inputs for the bright channel or for the normal channel, two inputs for the bright channel and you've probably seen old Marshalls with a jumper between the two channels to combine the bright and the normal channel. Um, Cheap Trick, I would imagine, would have used the inputs that are added on the back, which are disconnected now, but they would have combined it through some splitter box, so you would have had control over that. I decided one of the changes that I made from the way that it came to me was to combine the two channels internally, because with a, an old Marshall like this, you really want to be able to combine the bright and the dark channels and blend them together. Just to give you an idea, here's just the dark channel. As it is with most marshals. Yeah, I didn't have the tone control down, but still pretty dark. Now here's just the bright channel. Very bright. And typically it's one channel's too bright, one's too dark, but if you blend the two together, you can get the Goldilocks tone, right? I did 
do a little bit of tweaking to get the sweet spot as usable on the master volume as I could. Really didn't change the sound of the amp, but was able to widen the sweep of where you'd want to listen to it in. And of course, as with master volume amps, you know, you can do the turn the master down and really nail the preamp. loud that's not nearly as loud as a 100 watt Marshall will really be with the master volume turned up but just to give you a little taste of that we'll do we'll bring down the volumes again bring up the master to about eh, this is about two-thirds of the way up and this will be a little bit more of a traditional four input Marshall kind of sound here with a lot of the bright in there Conventional controls. The uh, the person who put the label on here, we'll have to assume that was the person who did the original mods, calls this a fat control. It's basically uh, wired into part of the treble control in the tone stack, and as you roll it through, you will get more mid-range presence and a little more aggressive sound. interact a lot with the treble control which would be this one here but uh, starting from this side the the on off switches and so forth this is a ground switch uh, polarity switch. Um, it is still hooked up. It was there when I when I got the amp and I just cleaned up some connections but it still exists if you need it for anything. Uh, generally speaking you probably leave it in the middle because it is a grounded chassis. Everything should be fine. You shouldn't really need that. Power switch, standby switch as with most British amps on is down as opposed to toggle up. Um, so again power, standby. Uh, Indicator light, obviously. Uh, just a little side story about that. The indicator light is probably not the original one, but it was original to this amp. In other words, it was there when I started working on it. It clearly had been there a long time. The little tiny incandescent bulb that was in there was literally taped into it like many things inside, <laughs> and, uh, and when I touched it, it fell off. So um, I, I took it apart but was able to retain the housing for it and I built in a, uh, a high intensity LED to make it look right, but it won't burn out. It should last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours and uh, you'll probably never have to mess with it. Um, getting back to this control here, uh, I'm actually gonna now jump over to the other side actually because this is where the volume control started. It'll make a little more sense. So input wise, as I mentioned, I modified it just slightly in that I combined the two channels inside since you no longer have the four inputs to allow the jumper. It's jumpered internally. Uh, so both channels are active at all times, but if you want to turn off one channel, literally just turn the volume control down on that, that particular channel. These are wired as they would be on one set of a, of a four input Marshall or a Fender. This is the high level input. In other words, it doesn't load down your guitar volume. This is the low input. So high, low, uh, generally speaking, you're gonna use this one because they almost always sound better. But if you have a hot guitar pickup and you wanna tame it down a little bit, you can plug into the low input and it'll, it'll tone things down. Uh, volume for the normal channel, which is the more bass, you know, more low end each channel. Volume for the bright channel, and again, sort of season to taste. You bring up the low channel and add bright until it is where you want it to be for a particular guitar. Uh, treble, middle, and bass uh, tone controls. As I mentioned, the treble control 
is tied in with this fat switch here, which is a bit like you might see on a matchless, like a DC-30 or something where they've got the rotary control for different uh, treble and mid-range combinations. Similar to what it's doing, but it's tied together with the treble control. So setting changes here will also change a little bit as you change the position of the treble control. The last control here was uh, was an interesting mod that I have never seen before, but I kind of liked it, and so definitely left it in there. This would normally be the presence control in a, in a Marshall, uh, which of course is sort of another treble-ish tone control in a traditional Marshall it, operating in a different part of the amp circuit. The presence control is no longer functional in this amplifier. It's sort of preset, and then this control has become a gain boost, if you will, for both channels. Uh, it works by uh, progressively introducing a, a uh, bypass capacitor to the cathode circuit of one of the gain stages in the amp. And it allows you to just kind of fatten things up a little bit if you roll that control up. Uh, here in a second, I'll probably just go through and run down the whole the whole line with a guitar plugged in and, and go over it again. But that's basically all the controls there. Obviously, the master volume there. And then on the back panel, maybe we should move around to the back. Traditional stuff here. I'll point out that over here, these two XLR type connectors are disconnected. They were disconnected when the amp came to me. My assumption is that those were used as the inputs for each channel that were then uh, routed back to some sort of splitter buffer box to allow multiple amps on stage. That is, is my best idea, and I'm pretty sure that's got to be what it was. Uh, this switch over here is a half power switch uh, that turns off two of the power tubes, cuts out the cathodes. I have wired this up to work and then I wired a jumper across it so that it does no longer operate as a half power switch. You just get full power and that's it. If you wanted to, it'd be very simple. I could explain it to any tech. I made it so you could literally clip two wires and it would be back as a, a half power switch. The reason I decided to run it this way is it's not very clearly marked. I didn't want to add any markings to the back of the amp and make it appear different than it was. And also, Marshall output transformers are notorious for being intolerant of any impedance mismatches and wanting to blow up. So uh, many Marshalls have bitten the dust that way. If you run a Marshall in half power, either by pulling two of the power tubes, which is a common trick, or by defeating them with a switch like this, you would then need to adjust your uh, impedance selector to half the setting of whatever the speaker load that you're running. So if you ran it half power, pulled two tubes, you would then turn it to eight ohms for your 16 ohm cabinet. Uh, basically, I just decided not to give you that option because so many people have blown up these amps by mismatching impedances and causing problems. But if you want to be able to access that, I will happily tell you or your tech exactly how to do it. Very simple thing. Uh, Three speaker jacks all in parallel to one another, so you can run all of the cabinets that you want to. And then, of course, a standard Marshall impedance selector here, which is probably not original to this amp. I believe this year of Marshall would have had the, uh, the one that plugs in and you, you, know, you unplug it, turn it to the next position or whatever. Notorious for getting lost. So <laughs> somewhere along the way, they had it modified to use the one that you can't lose you know in kansas somewhere on tour so there you have it that's all the controls uh it is uh, a permanently attached power cord it's set up for 120 volts uh there is no external power connector so you're going to have to or power selectors you're going to have to run it in at 120 volts uh, if you wanted to you could have a tech go in there and rewire at the circuit board for a different voltage but then it would be permanently set at that voltage so I thought I should show you what the tube complement is on this amplifier because it is not the same as a stock Marshall of this year. Uh, the power tubes are four EL34 tubes. Uh, in, in England uh, and, and that side of the world, they would have used EL34s. By that time in America, they may have been using 6550s. When it came to me, it had these EL34s in there. I believe Greg Germino actually uh, put these in. Yeah. Um, and they're a good set of good sounding modern EL34s and that's it was set up to run with them so I left that that way. Uh, 
I personally do prefer the EL34 sound in Marshalls, but there are there are devotees to both sides. Uh, preamp tube wise is where we kind of need to, to figure out what's what. You'll notice that there's more preamp tubes in here than you would expect to see in a Marshall of this era. Uh, this one right here is the one that would not have normally been in there. There's somebody uh, drilled the, the hole in the chassis and added a tube socket added a gain stage. Um, if you look real carefully here, you might be able to see some old magic marker marks that I was able to unearth from under the scudge that was on top of it when I got the amp in. When I, when I got it, it had three 12AX7s, 12AX7, 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 and in this spot was a 12AT7. It's not the way it is now, but I'll explain why in a second. But uh, when I got it running, it had too much gain. 12AX7 is just a, a very high gain tube. It's the standard sort of preamp tube. Uh, but too many of them in a row in this circuit was too much. And I started looking at it and I could see the remnants of some writing under the dirt. So I kind of scraped it off and was able to see 12AU7 in this position. So I figured it out, 12AU7, much lower gain. We'll go with the 12AU7 there. And the, the circuit values in that part of the circuit had been changed from Marshall values and it's sort of making sense now, okay? They really did intend to use a 12AU7 there. So I put a good old American uh, RCA 12AU7 in there that I had around. Um, and then I stuck with 12AX7 here and a 12AX7 here. This position, uh, I went with a 12AY7. Now, uh, originally, I can still see the markings here. They had a 12AT7 in there. And a 12AT7 is a tube that's very common in fenders. Uh, lower gain than a 12AX7, higher current uh, delivery capability. I find personally that 12AT7s don't sound very good in a gain stage situation. They sound good to drive a reverb tank or to use as a phase inverter, but uh, generally I don't like them in, in a gain stage. A 12AY7 is a tube that has very similar gain structure to a 12AT7. It's, it's about 40% uh, of the gain thereabouts of a 12AX7. A 12AT7 is about eh, 50 some percent, 50 to 60 percent of the gain of a 12AX7. And I believe why they went with the AT there originally was again, they wanted, they had added a gain stage, but they didn't want quite as much gain. Anyway, you can certainly run a 12AT7 in that spot. My recommendation is a 12AY7. That's what's in there now, and I think you'll, you'll like the way it sounds. So I'll just run it down end to end. 12AX7, 12AX7, 12AY7. 12AU7, and then of course the EL34s.